Malik gets some tiger-sized dentistry, uncovering the mysteries of New Zealand's rarest native frog. Big fat female on the left who's full of eggs and two potential suitors on the right. And monkey business direct from Wellington. <laughs> Get out of the way. <laughs> the animals of Auckland Zoo are in fine form as they look forward to another sunny day and breakfast. Most of the creatures can handle their keepers being around while they eat. But Sandra Rice knows it's a different kettle of meat with tigers Malik, Barani and Oz. Some people think that we just feed animals and pick up poo, but it's so diverse, the job, and it's so in-depth. And we've all got so many stories that are fun and just the different things that we get to do in this job is something that's really fabulous. Today, Sandra is spending time with female tiger Malik, who's getting a new contraceptive implant. The reason that we have to contracept Malik is because at the moment she's being kept with Barani, her son. Barani now is reaching sexual maturity, so there was no way that we would risk any pregnancy between Malik and Barani. In a happy coincidence, Malik would have needed anaesthetic anyway. Sandra's noticed she has a broken tooth. Sedating a big predator can be a risky business, so the team take every precaution. Zoo vet Anna leads the pre-treatment briefing. Everyone, the main aim today is to get a contraceptive implant into Malik. When she started, she's going to be in the smaller one. Um, we're going to dart her with a combination of metatomine and ketamine, and that'll have her down for a little while. We will reverse her at the end of the procedure, but we'll need to have her under for at least 45 minutes for the ketamine to wear off anyway. And I understand that she's got a fractured canine that we need to check, so we'll have a look at that. Okay. Ready to go? Yeah. Went in. <laughs> For any dangerous animal knockouts that we do at the zoo, such as uh, orangutans, uh, lions and tigers, we always require a gun handler just in case anything may go wrong. Malik looks fast asleep, but with teeth like hers, Anna needs to be absolutely sure her big stripy friend is out for the count. With Malik judged to be as harmless as a kitten, the process begins. With only an hour up their sleeves, the team moves fast. Back here. How is it? That's where we put it. It turns out the hard work has already been done. The implant itself is an easy procedure. It basically just goes in under the skin like a microchip. And it should last her about 12 months. While Anna finishes the implant, Sandra explains the reason for what she's doing. It's very rare that we get to knock our tigers out. So this is just to make a plaster cast of her paw, which enables us to do paw prints that can be sold to raise money for the conservation fund. This is the front paw. Um, oh, that's fabulous. In the back, it looks awesome. Now there's just one last job to be done. What we're looking at is Malik's left uh, upper canine. She's sheared a piece off a little while ago, and we're just checking on the damage of that. I think the gum looks a little bit red there. She's vulnerable to getting an infection in that tooth travelling up. Yeah. Unfortunately for Malik, that means an appointment with the dentist in a couple of weeks. But for the moment, she needs to be left to recover from the anaesthetic. Oh, oh Molly. Yeah. It's no surprise that Primates team leader Amy Robbins is also up to her elbows in fur. We had heaps of pets growing up. We used to breed mice and frogs and chickens and rabbits and guinea pigs and birds and I used to be a real little geek and keep like a little stud book of all the birds that I had and like who could swap with who and keep their genetics and stuff. And I didn't even know what that meant at that stage but I just thought it was a good idea. Today she's in the capital, miles from home on a very special mission. I'm visiting Wellington Zoo on a cold and rainy Wellington day and I'm about to meet some squirrel monkeys that are destined for Auckland Zoo. Uh, Wellington kindly imported a whole lot from Europe and they've taken some and we're going to be getting some. So I'm here just to learn about how we're able to look after them and set up an enclosure for them and sort out a date to get them up to Auckland. 
Wellington zookeeper Harmony Wallace has been entertaining these busy Bolivian squirrel monkeys since they flew in from Germany. They're a new species for Auckland Zoo, so Amy wants to learn all she can about how to look after them. I'm mixing in protein powder, folic acid, vitamin B12, and a couple of bananas to make it taste nice. Um, and we've found if we make it nice and watery, mix it in with the food, then they can't pick it out and not eat it because it's really important for them to have, especially coming into breeding season. With ours, are there any kind of obvious personalities or are they all just uh, naughty? <laughs> they're all a bit cheeky. There are some really cute ones. There's one female who, she's only got one eye. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> She's probably oh one of the most friendly ones. She's the one that instigates everybody jumping yeah. on you. She climbs on as soon as you walk through the door. Oh my goodness. Don't like that? Within seconds, Amy is swamped by the original cheeky little monkeys. They seem to be so interactive and just so dynamic and they'll make such a great exhibit. And just the fact that it's, um, you know, there's not a lot of, <laughs> there's not a lot of primates that we can actually have contact with and go on with them because they're, either too dangerous or whatever, so this is really cool that we can actually um, get up really close, we can check them out. So we're going to, I think, have a really good relationship with them and also do some really good training. The big troop of three males and five females will soon make their new home at Auckland Zoo's rainforest. One of the reasons that I'm down in Wellington is just to, um, to check out our group, but also just to start forming some kind of relationship with them. Primates are pretty smart and I'm, even though I'm only here for a short time they do have um, a good memory so as long as I'm here being the provider of food and all things nice then hopefully I'll be a slightly familiar face at least when they arrive in Auckland in a couple of weeks time. Back at Auckland Zoo, the myriad of magical animals from all over the world continue to delight all comers. But tucked away out the back is a true enigma of the forest. It's New Zealand's native Archie's frog, a species so rare they're not on public display. They're one of the oldest frog species in the world, and fully grown, Archie's frogs are only the size of a bottle top. One of the things that makes Archie's frog so interesting is that uh, it is internationally recognised, despite being a small brown frog, um, as the world's number one edge species. Edge stands for in evolutionarily distinct, globally endangered. Very little still known about them. We don't know how and if they communicate with each other. They have no voice to speak of. Although they squeak if they're stressed, they have like a predator response, which is a little squeak. They have no external ears, so they probably don't have a great um, a sense of hearing. So we don't really know how males attract females or, or how males compete with each other if they do compete with each other. There's a lot to learn. I think we can do a lot of that in these sorts of semi-natural captive environments with the right equipment. And if anyone wants to learn more about these miniature icons, it's Richard. I was one of those kids that kept creepy crawlies and snakes and everything else in his bedroom. I grew up surrounded by animals, bird watching, and my parents were wildlife enthusiasts. So yeah, it was a kind of inevitable that I'd end up working with animals. In recent years, the frog's population has plummeted by 80% in the wild. So Richard is spending a lot of time trying to convince these tiny treasures to breed. In the last sort of 10 or 15 years or so, there's been no success at all in producing Archie's frogs. The frogs here at the zoo are producing eggs regularly now, but we still haven't had any fertile eggs actually develop and hatch. So we've got all three frogs big fat female on the left who's full of eggs, we're waiting for her to lay, and two potential suitors on the right. Unlike many animals and kiwi blokes, the male Archie's frog does the toughest job of all, looking after the babies. This enclosure holds a group of frogs that we know has started breeding this year. Inside that little container with the blue lid, we do have a male who's sitting with a clutch of eggs. He's guarding them and brooding them as he should. So we're basically keeping them undisturbed. And in the enclosure next door, we have another male also sitting on a clutch of eggs, and he's completely on his own, so he's not being disturbed by any other frogs. So we're, we've got our fingers crossed. These males have been sitting now for over two weeks. So we're hoping that means that the frogs know what they're doing and that they know that their clutches are fertile, they haven't deserted them yet. And uh, if they are fertile, another six or eight weeks will tell us that and uh, hopefully, you know, just maybe we might get some little baby frogs out of this. So this is a bit of progress. Auckland Zoo is home to animals of every stripe. One of the most popular is the big female tiger, Malik. 
Today, she's getting ready for the biggest root canal in the business. Zuvet Anna Le Cerf is a key member of the team looking after her today. I come from Australia. Previously, I was working at a zoo back over there and um, I was asked to come over here and do a locum and it was a great opportunity for me because I've always wanted to come and work in New Zealand and um, heard great things about Auckland Zoo so I jumped at the chance. With time at a premium, Anna will give Malik a general health check while vet dentist Russell Tucker investigates that big toothy grin. It's a job he's used to but on a much grander scale. It's really interesting for us. I mean we're inside doing cats and dogs all day so for us to get the opportunity to come and do and help it uh, be doing exotic pets is really quite a challenge. Malik needs a root canal, so of course there's no escaping the dreaded drill. It's always fun watching someone else go to the dentist. I have to say this last month I've been about eight times and it's great that it's not me, but um, it's really fascinating to see um, the difference in a tiger's mouth and a large carnivore and how huge their teeth actually are because it's not just the bits that you see you know, out of the gum, it's the bits that go way back, which makes it double in length. So they're, they're really, really huge too. Root is where my finger is. I can feel it there. So this will go right to the tip. So these ones are made especially for lions and tigers. We all know what a toothache feels like. And the way that Malik's tooth is sheared off shows that it has the potential to get very infected and very sore. So she may actually be a totally different cat after this surgery, because she may be experiencing pain that we're not picking up on. At the less fearsome end, Anna and Bethany are examining Malik's furry tummy. We're not particularly concerned, but we're checking her kidneys. Um, she's an older cat, and her recent blood results have been fine in terms of kidney function, but because we've got a little bit of time, we're just doing some extra tests and mm. having a look at the appearance of her kidneys, and they look really healthy as, as far as we can see. This is root canal cement. Trying to force it down into the root with this precious syringe. I think we've got it, actually. Stick a little bit in that one. So this is the cement that's used to help fill the canal along with these things here. These will show up on x-ray and we can tell from the x-ray whether we've actually filled it correctly or not. I think it was very successful. I think that should be fine for her. I think that will last her for the rest of her life. The only thing is, I mean, if she goes and breaks the tooth like she did the first time, we may have to come back and do another filling on it. But other than that, I mean, she looks good. What's well, awesome now that it's finished, it looks like a fantastic job. So um, we'll be really eager to get her back and recover her new den and see how she goes. One, two, three. <laughs> Down in windy, wet Wellington, Amy's been having fun with a lively tribe of squirrel monkeys before they move in to Auckland Zoo. While Amy's here, she's got eyes for more than just her new primates. I really love getting around to other zoos and just seeing what they've got, seeing if there's potential to develop our stuff further. Also just sharing ideas and stuff and, and meeting um, the keepers as well because we're all kind of the same breed of people. You know, we're all a little bit quirky and a bit different and we kind of understand we're on the same wavelength. My visit to Wellington Zoo today has been really valuable. I've, I've learnt quite a bit. It's been awesome to meet our monkeys and the Wellington Keepers have just been so good with their time um, sharing their knowledge with me today. So now we're just going to gear up for our animals to come back to Auckland and I'll get my team really revved up and excited and I can't wait for them to meet our animals as well. But all in all, it's been a great day. You monkeys have been very good, thank you. Back in Auckland, the zoo's big cats are always a big draw card. Barani and Oz are doing what male tigers do best, look awesome. In her den, Malik has recovered well from the dentist. Well enough to be able to crunch up her favourite food, goat. Her sore tooth is clearly sore no more. She's eating on that side, she's having no problem with that at all. We haven't noticed any rubbing or any infection or any, any irritation from her either, so it's been 
Perfect. We couldn't have asked for actually a better outcome with her tooth. She's like a new woman. But one busy part of the zoo is about to get a whole lot busier. Amy's turned up with the raucous squirrel monkeys from Wellington. Oh, hi! Hi! So I finally had them on the ground. Here is just awesome. And I just can't wait to get them out because they've just been stuck in here for ages now and they'll, they'll be getting quite hungry and quite stressed. So the sooner we can get them settled, the better. As part of Auckland Zoo's quarantine screening procedures, Amy puts on protective clothing before releasing them. And they're off. Somehow, eight squirrel monkeys seem like 80. There you go, one more. Well done. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, for the next little while, it'll just be the keepers getting to know them because at the moment there's only one of them that we can tell apart, and that's the one with one eye. <laughs> so we're just going to take it really slowly and we'll just let them settle in and, yeah, just a period of getting to know each other, really, and then we'll take it from there. It's another day of soaking up sun rays for the reptiles at Auckland Zoo. But today, the collection of rare Archie's frogs is waiting on a very special visitor from the US who's going to help Richard sort his girls from his boys. We don't actually know the sex of all our frogs. Externally, you just can't tell the difference. So that's one of our challenges, knowing which animals to pair up with which animals. San Diego-based specialist Jen Germano has pioneered a way to tell if frogs are male or female. She takes some of their urine and simply tests it. Before, the way that people used to collect hormones for frogs in particular was looking at the hormone levels in blood. And the only way you can get blood from a frog is through cardiac puncture of the heart. Um, and this is really stressful for the animals and for the scientists that have to do it. Um, and so being able to use frog wee is a much easier way. In this case, we're gonna use tiny little frog catheters, which is also takes a couple minutes that hardly bothers the frogs at all. And we can gain the same kind of information we used to get from blood, but in a much more friendly way that doesn't hurt the animal. Is going first. And just like the capillary action, like just going in and out really slowly. If there's something there, it's usually enough to... We just buy medical grade, really small catheters. Then we cut them to the length that we need them. And you burn one end so it's really soft, so it's not sharp when you put it in the frog. And you just need to make sure it doesn't come out the other end since you have to blow it out. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, We've had the uh, results of the urinary hormone test for the sexing of the frogs. And uh, the really good news is we've actually got more males than we thought. We've actually got five males in our total group. And we only knew of two before, so that's a, a huge benefit. Because it means that's five times as many clutches of eggs that can be guarded at any one time. And of course, even just pairing up the frogs. If we didn't know what sexes they were, we really didn't know who to put with who. So uh, just knowing which is a male and which is a female makes it much, much easier for us to manage the, manage the frogs in captivity. Well, this is just one more question we've ticked off in a long list of unknowns about Archie's frogs, but it puts us in a much better situation to hopefully breed them in the future. Hi, little red bag. From the most shy and retiring to the noisiest newcomers. So, <laughs> get out of the way. <laughs> Our eight little squirrel monkeys have adjusted really well to life in here. They're just getting on really great. We've established a really good relationship with them. Um, they're all um, into a routine now. They're coming inside when we ask them to, um, getting into all sorts of mischief, picking our pockets at every opportunity. Um, and they're just proving to be lots of fun. So we're really excited to be able to get them out on display really soon and share them with the public. But one of the eight squirrel monkeys has flown up from Wellington with extra baggage. We noticed that one of the females was starting to look a bit fat and we thought maybe we were overfeeding them but then she just got bigger and bigger and bigger and none of the others did. So we realised that she was pregnant and she was the only one that was pregnant so it must have happened in Europe before they actually got here. Oh. So here we have, um, get out of my pockets, here we have um, Rataplan which is the mother and little teeny tiny baby who always seems to be asleep. Guys just be gentle. 
all the baby does is just ride around on mum's back and just um, sleep for most of the day. And then when she wants to have a feed, she just kind of spins around onto the front of mum and has a suckle and then, and then spins back again. The tiny baby is called Che Che, which is an African name meaning little thing. She'll hang out on mum's back for a couple of months until she's weaned. Basically, we're just letting mum be. Um, we don't want to interfere or intervene because that's more likely to cause problems with her abandoning it or getting too uptight and stressed that she drops it. So we've just really let her be, basically, and she's being a great mum. <laughs> you guys are so bad. <laughs> a few weeks later and the monkeys are out of quarantine and exploring every inch of their new rainforest home. These monkeys in the wild are some of the most playful primates around and definitely the most playful animals that we have on our section. They just get such a joy out of life. It's just really nice because they're just a really positive, upbeat. <laughs> they're just lovely. We're having so much fun with them. <laughs> Next week on The Zoo, a wobbly start for the new giraffe calf. An endangered native bird gets hands-on attention. And cheetahs Osiris and Anubis go walkabout. <laughs>